Welcome to lecture 5.5, Projection and Least Squares. Recall from the previous lecture that the adjoint of a linear map A is a linear map A star that goes backwards from U to X with the property that the inner product of AX and U in big U is equal to the inner product of X and A star U in big X. So one way to think about this algebraically is that if you want to move the a to the other side of the inner product, you have to put a star in front of it. However, this algebraic definition only gives half of the picture. For the full intuition, it helps to look at this commutative diagram that we went over in detail in the previous lecture. So given the linear map a, before we have any inner product structure on x or u, we have a notion of the transpose map, which goes backwards between the dual spaces, sending a dual vector or linear function l to the dual vector in x, which is m. Now, when we define, when we put an inner product structure on x, we get a natural identification with elements in the dual, namely that sends a vector y to the linear function, the linear functional, that you get by just plugging in y into the second coordinate, or either coordinate. So this defines a natural map between elements in u and elements in x, and that is called the adjoint. And the adjoint obviously depends on the inner product structure of x and u, whereas the transpose does not. We say that a linear map A is self-adjoint if it is equal to its adjoint. This is an important concept that we will see throughout the remainder of this course. And our first example of it is for any linear map A, the maps A star A and A A star are self-adjoint. Now this is basically a one-line proof. And I'll remind you that if you have maps A and B, then AB star equals B star A star behaves just like transpose. So if you take A star A and you compute the adjoint, then you get A star A star star, which is A star A. And the proof of this one is analogous. Our next example of self-adjoint maps are orthogonal projections. We saw this a few lectures ago. If we have a subspace y, then x is the direct sum of y and its orthogonal complement, meaning every vector x can be written uniquely as little y plus little y perp. And the orthogonal projection onto y just picks off the part in y and discards the part in its orthogonal complement. It is elementary to show that orthogonal projections are self-adjoint. Now let's think about how one would go about doing this. Now first of all, I'm going to write p instead of p sub y just for simplicity. But to show that p is equal to p star, now we, we always know that the inner product of px with z, I'm avoiding using y because y is a subspace, is equal to the inner product of x with p star z. So that, that's always true. But we, what we have to do is show that this is equal to the inner product of x and p z. So for all x and z and x. So we really just have to show that these two things are equal. So let's start with two vectors. Let's let x, um, let's call it, say x equals y. 1 plus y1 perp, and z equals y2 plus y2 perp in x. And I think it's clear that I mean y1 and y2 are in big Y, and y1 perp and y2 perp are in the orthogonal complement. So let's start with the inner product of p, x, and z, and just follow our nose. Now, you can do this in like three steps or ten steps, depending on how many intermediate steps you want to include. Um, so, inner product, or so P of, of X is just Y1. So this, so, this is Y1 with 
y2 plus y2 perp. So this is inner product of y1 with y2 perp. Let's start with y2 plus y1 dot y2 perp. And of course, this is, this is 0. So now what I'm going to do is go backwards, but um, put the p in the other coordinate. So in other words, I'm going to write this as y1, y2, plus y1 perp, comma, y2. And then write this as y1 plus y1 perp, comma, y2. Again, this is one of those steps I probably didn't have to add. This is x, and this is the projection um, p onto, or p applied to z. So this is p z, and that's what we had to show. Now, some, if not many books, define a projection, that is, without the word orthogonal, to be any linear map p from a space to itself, such that p squared equals p. I like to call this idempotent, as this is what the concept is called more generally in other areas of math with other algebraic structures, but regardless, it is not hard to show that for such a map, p, x decomposes into a direct sum of its range and the null space. And when I say it's not hard, let me just show you how it goes without really writing out it formally. If the dimension of x is n and the dimension of the range is r, the dimension of the null space is n minus r. So it suffices to show that x is the sum of the range and the null space. And then the direct sum just follows from the dimension argument. So why is this true? Well, let's just take any vector in x, and I claim that we can decompose it as something in the range, namely px, plus something in the null space, i minus p times x. Now, clearly, this sum is equal to x, and why is this thing in the null space? Well, if you take i minus p x and you apply p to it, you get p x minus p squared x. And for a projection, this is p squared equals p, so this is p x minus p x, which is 0. I will leave the following exercise for the homework. A projection, in this sense, is an orthogonal projection, that is, up here, if and only if it is self-adjoint. So this is the converse of Proposition 5.10. So 5.10 says that if a projection is orthogonal projection, then it's self-adjoint. This exercise says if a projection is self-adjoint, then it is an orthogonal projection. Let's now turn our attention back to the all-important map A star A, which we saw a few slides ago. This appears throughout applied math and statistics, and one reason for that is because it is self-adjoint, as we've seen. But now I want to focus on another key property, namely that it has the same null space as A. Now let's say that A goes from X to U, and A star goes from u to x. So a star a, remember composition we read right to left, means we first do a, then a star. So that this, this, goes from, this goes from x to itself, whereas a goes from x to u. So even though the images of these maps are you know, live in different spaces, their null spaces are going to be subspaces of, of x. OK, so let's write down a quick proof. But first of all, it is clear that one containment holds, namely that the null space of A is contained in the null space of A star A, because this is a composition of map. So we, we do A, and then we do something else. So the null space can only get bigger. So that is, is easy. So let's do the other direction. How, do, how does that go? Let's take 
some x in the null space of a star a. So in other words, a star a x equals 0. Our goal is to show that it's also in the null space of a. So we'll take the inner product of a star a x with x. Now clearly this is this is 0. Why is it 0? Because this thing here is equal to 0. So what we'll do now is just move this a star over to the right hand side. And we get the inner product of ax with ax. And notice that this is the norm squared of ax. And that's, again, equal to 0. So anytime the norm of a vector equals 0, that means that particular vector has to be 0. And that's exactly what it means for x to be in the null space of a, that ax is equal to 0. And that completes the proof. An important corollary of this is suppose that a is an m by n matrix where m is bigger than n. So think about like a tall and skinny matrix and the columns are linearly independent. This might happen in statistics if you have columns that come from experimental data, um, then you would expect these things to be linearly independent if the data is random. Then there are two things that we can conclude. Neither of these are surprising, but they are worth noting. First of all, the columns of A, let me write, let me draw this, the columns of A, we know they always span the column space trivially, but if the columns are independent, that means they form a basis for the column space. In other words, the range of A. So if, if A is M times N, so again, that's M of these and N of these, then the second thing is that A star A is invertible. So A star A is, so A star is N by so I should probably, let me remind you that this is, this is n of these. So n is less than m. So a star a is n by m. And a is m by n. So when you take the product of two matrices, remember you cancel the inside ones, and you get something that is n by n. So it will be a square matrix. And we know that this has the same rank as this. So this is also going to have n columns. And since these n columns are linearly independent, so are these n columns. In other words, this square matrix is invertible. And that's going to be useful because, as we'll see later in this lecture, we'll learn how to write projection matrices involving the inverse of this matrix. Moving on, the fact that a star a and a have the same null space along with the following fact, which I will call corollary 5.12, is the crux of the so-called least squares method of finding the best fit line through a collection of points. So remember what that looks like from your, maybe your science class. You've got a bunch of points like this, and you want to find the best fit line, which is going to minimize the square of these so-called error terms. And as we will see, it's, it's going to be hard to motivate this without an example, but we will do one on the next slide. But when we get something like this, that will correspond to a system AX equals B that has no solution. Now, there will be a solution if all these points are collinear, which is typically not the case. And moreover, such a system, as we'll see, is going to be underdetermined. So think of it as like having a tall, skinny matrix A times X equals B. And since and these columns are going to correspond to these data points, so generally, if these are random data points, these columns are going to be linearly independent. So this says that suppose we have an underdetermined system AX equals B, like this, 
where A has trivial null space. Then the unique vector that minimizes the norm of AX minus B, you can think of this as which vector X gets AX closest to the solution B, is the solution to the following related system that you get by just multiplying the left and the right hand side of this by A star. So in other words, let me write this down as, as the big idea. If you can't solve, so if, if AX equals B has no solution, as typically will happen in a system like this, and then if the columns of A are merely independent, then just multiply both sides by A star, then solve A star A X equals A star B instead. Now I should actually probably call, instead of calling this X, I should probably call this Z because this Z is different. There is a Z that's out, that solves this, whereas there is no X that solves this. Next, I claim, let me write this down, that AX minus B is minimized, minimizing the squares, the same as just minimizing the norm itself, for X equals Z satisfying AZ minus B being orthogonal to the range. So in other words, this is minimized for the particular vector for which AZ minus B is orthogonal to the range. And that is basically just, it, it's basic geometry, and it's just the Pythagorean theorem. I think if I draw a picture, it should make it clear. So let's take the range of A, and let's, let's so B is some vector up here that is not in the range. So there, if we have, let's say we have some x here and we have some z here, there, there's no vector x or z or anything over here in x that is going to map to b because it's not on the range. But what we want to do is we want to minimize ax minus b. So what that is going to be is that is the, so if, if this is ax, then this, this vector here is AX minus B. Let me make sure that I, that I actually got this right. So, so th this is the origin. If this is AX, so AX minus AX minus B is indeed equal to B. Okay, and what we want to do is, is we want to minimize this, this distance right that's the thing that, that we want to minimize. And so clearly, that's going to be minimized when this is perpendicular, just by the Pythagorean theorem. So in other words, this is going to be minimized for, for um, so let's say that z is what minimizes this. So in other words, this z maps to this vector here. It should be clear from this picture that this minimum distance occurs when this is perpendicular to the range. Again, that's, that's the Pythagorean theorem. If you're not convinced, let me write it out. So um, this red vector is a z minus b. So let's write out um, the norm of a x minus b squared. So that's but the Pythagorean theorem, this squared equals that squared plus that squared. So this squared, so that's going to be a z minus b norm squared plus, now what's, what's this distance here? That distance, uh, let, me, let me use yellow for this. Maybe that was a bad idea. That's going to be, so this, this vector here, let me, I should probably use a, a different color. How about purple? So if we call this vector y, which is just x minus z, then this here is just a times y. So 
plus ay squared. So this is, on the left-hand side, this is what we want to minimize. So let me, let me write that up. So we, so we want to minimize. So, so x, x is the thing that's varying, that's moving around. So x, th this thing over here is the thing that, that, that can go different places. But this az is fixed because this is the, the unique one that is orthogonal. To be. So clearly this quantity is minimized when this is equal to zero, and that's when y equals zero, that precisely means that x equals y. So again, I probably didn't need to go through all this description, but you know, I do like this picture, and I do credit, I want to credit Gil Strang for it. This is there's a couple topics that I'm pulling from his book. Mostly I'm following Peter Lax's book, but there are some really neat ways that he presents some materials, some ideas, and this, I think, is one of them. Okay, so we've, we've shown this, and now what's, what's next is, so let me call this thing claim two, so we'll call it claim one, is that this particular z that minimizes this distance, I claim solves this equation right here. So this z, above solves what we want, a star a z equals a star b. So again, if ax equals b has no solution, we can always solve this. So let's see why that's the case. Well, by the Pythagorean theorem, or actually not the Pythagorean theorem, but what we just showed, which follows from the Pythagorean theorem, this vector, az minus b, is orthogonal to this vector, ay. So, in other words, we just showed that az minus b is orthogonal to ay, and this, this is for, I forget if I was using parentheses or brackets for inner product, I'll just keep it like this, for all y in, in x. So in other words, z is fixed, and as I change x, the, this y is going to change. So in other words, for all possible y, this, th oh, I forgot to say this, this is equal to zero. Okay, so now what do you want to do when you see this? Well, you have two a's here, and you want to move one of them over. So let's move this a here to the left-hand side, and let's write this as a product of a star, a z minus b, with y equals zero for all, I think you probably see where I'm going with this. So if I can put anything I want here and take the inner product with this and it gets zero, then it better be the case that this first entry is zero. So thus, a star times a z minus b has to be equal to zero. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. So that is equivalent to this equation right here. You, if you multiply it out, so um, thus a star a z equals a star b. So there's really nothing difficult about this. It was basically just the Pythagorean theorem. And we didn't have to draw this picture, but it, I think it really does help. Okay, so once again, big idea. If you can't solve ax equals b, multiply left and right-hand side by a star, and you are left with something that you can solve. Okay, now I will do an explicit example of least squares. So you will believe me when I say that finding the best fit line corresponds to solving an undetermined system and, um, yeah, undetermined system, ax equals b. Again, I like to draw it like this because we can really see that there are more equations than there are variables. So this example is also from Gil Strang's book. I think it's perfect. I was thinking of changing the numbers, but I don't think you can change the numbers to be any better than this. So let's find the best fit line. So let's suppose that we have, um, so I'm going to call this t, and 1, 2, so this is 1, 2, 3, this is 1, 2, so I have three three points. One of them is 1, 1. One of them is 2, 2. 
and one of them is 3, 2. And just sketching the so-called best fit line, it makes sense that it will look something like this. And we know from our science classes that we want to minimize the square of these error terms. So let's see how that leads to a solution. So, um, so the goal, what? I don't even need to write the goal. I, I think I, I say the goal here. Let's find the best fit line. So if there were such a line that actually did go through those three points, then we could take this equation here and we could plug in one and get out one. We could plug in two and get out two. We could plug in three and get out two. Now, I just realized I wrote t here and I wrote x here, so it doesn't really matter. Let me call this x to be consistent. So, so let's do that. Let's, let's plug one into here. So we get a naught plus one times a one, and we get that would be equal to one. So again, the input goes here and the output goes, goes here. Similarly, if we were to plug two in for x, we would get a naught plus two a one, and that would be equal to two. That goes here. And then if we were to plug in three into here, we would get a naught plus three a one, and we would get that equal to two. So that would be equal to two here. So we, we would get this, this system here, which has too many equations. If we want to write this in matrix form, this is clearly 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3 times a naught a1 equals 1, 2, 2. Okay. So this, let's call this ax equals b, which has clearly no solution. And so instead we will solve, we'll take this equation, multiply it left and right by a star, and get a star a, call it z, equals a star b. So once again, I'm using a different z because I, I don't want to solve this for x and then say, oh, that's the same x as this because it's not the same x. There is no x here. So I'm, I'm going to do this pretty quickly. So a star a is just that's the transpose, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, times 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, times, let's call, let's call this z1, z2, and a star b, so again, a star is 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, times b, which is 1, 2, 2. Okay, so let's simplify this. Right here we have, uh, let's see, this is going to be I think 5, and then it's going to be 1 plus 4 is 5, plus 6 is, that's going to be 11. And then over here, we're going to get Z1, Z2 times a 2 by 2 matrix. So this first entry is going to be 3. This next entry is going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3. That's going to be 6. This other entry is 6. This is symmetric. Then we get 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared. That's 1 plus 4, which is 5, plus 9, which is 14. So we have this equation at that matrix times z1, z2 equals 5, 11. Now, I literally just pause this video to type the system in Wolfram Alpha because I really didn't feel like doing it by hand. And it's easy to check that the solution is Z1 equals 2 thirds and Z2 equals 1 half. So in other words, this entry is going to be two-thirds, um, or actually I should probably write it up here, so th this is going to be two-thirds, and this is going to be one-half, so this line here is one-half 
So y equals 1 half x plus 2 thirds. I actually did a pretty good job at drawing this. This is approximately supposed to be uh, 2 thirds, and the slope here is 1 half. Okay, so one more comment. This solution is unique because we have a square matrix that has full rank. And remember that the rank of A star A is the rank of A. So as long as the columns of A are linearly independent, then A star A is going to have full rank, and this will have a unique solution. So let me write that down. This has a unique solution, in this case, bets fit line, if and only if the columns of A are linearly independent. And this is typically going to happen if we have some you know, random data points that's generated, say, from experimental data. Finally, I want to finish this lecture with a very useful fact, especially in applied math and statistics, about how to generate an orthogonal projection map onto any subspace. So let me try to recreate that picture that I drew a couple of slides ago. So suppose we have a, a subspace Y, and we have a vector B, and we want to project B orthogonally. So what we literally want to do is we want to find you know, what vector down here minimizes this, this distance. So I wrote this as Y, but if we take any basis for Y and we write it into a matrix, let's, let's say a equal, actually I have it written here, so A is, so we take any basis, so these things are, are like column vectors up to YK, then Y is the range of A. So let's, let's call this uh, U and let's call this X, and I'm going to do what we did before. I'm going to call this, I'm going to say that there's, there's some vector Z over here that gets mapped to this AZ, and we know how to find such a Z. So there, there's no vector that gets mapped to B, but there is a vector that gets mapped to AZ that minimizes this, and the key idea is that Z solves a, so I should say AX equals B has no solution, but we can multiply both sides by A star and get A star A Z equals A star B. So this has a solution, and moreover, since the columns of A are literally independent, A star A is invertible. So let me let me write this, A star A is invertible. So we can multiply both sides by the inverse of A star A, and we get that Z equals A star A inverse times A star B. So we have just come up with a formula for this vector Z that maps to the projection of B. So, so this is, is the projection of B onto Y. So we have a formula for this Z. So a formula for the actual A, the projection AZ, we get by just multiplying both sides by A. So again, this Z is here. So this AZ is what we get by just multiplying both sides by A. So AZ, which I've already said is the projection of B onto Y, is A times A star A inverse times A star B. So the key idea here is that if you have B that is not in this subspace for Y, then you can take any old basis for Y, create the matrix 
A, which where that basis is in the columns, and then this matrix here, A times A star A inverse times A star is the projection matrix. And what I mean by that is literally if you take that matrix and you multiply it by B, you will get AZ, in other words, the projection of B onto that subspace. So I'm highlighting this because we were dancing all around it. It wasn't something that we went in trying to solve, but from our analysis of orthogonal projections, um, this very useful fact popped out. So hopefully I've convinced you why this linear map A star A is so useful. And uh, remember this, because if you take um, an applied math or especially a statistics course, you'll see this equation again. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. Coming up, um, we will talk about isometries. So these are, I don't want to say linear maps, these, these are maps between vector spaces that preserve distances. Think of them as rigid motions. We will prove that any such map has to be linear up to a translation. And we'll analyze what the matrices of these maps look like. You've likely heard the name. They are called orthogonal matrices in the orthogonal group. So stay with us.